Many of you watching are no doubt related to well-known Canadians who have made an impact on the world. But I dare say none of you is related to someone who has gone down in history as the greatest fighter pilot this country has ever produced. If you're trying to make your mark in the world, how do you compete with that? That question and others have all been part of the life of Diana Bishop, whose new book, Living Up to a Legend, My Adventures with Billy Bishop's Ghost, brings her to our studio tonight. It is so delightful to see you again. Oh, it's great to be here. And I have to say right off the top here, I mean, the crazy thing is you and I have known each other a long time when you were reporting and I was reporting, mm -hmm. and I never knew who your grandfather was. And it wasn't until you made a documentary, which we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. that I put two and two together. Is that, I mean, am I the stupidest guy in the world not to know that who your grandfather was? No, absolutely not. Because I think, you know, when you grow up with somebody really famous, you wait for somebody to introduce you as Billy Bishop's granddaughter. You don't go around telling people you're Billy Bishop's granddaughter. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, so that's what I did. Uh, Diana, we have a lot of new Canadians. We have mm -hmm. a lot of young Canadians who watch this program and don't know who Billy Bishop is. So give us the primer off the top. Who was your grandpa? Well, the way I like to look at it is that he was the first breed of fighter pilots. So he was the first knights of the air. And so when you think of that, that first group of people that had to go to war in World War I, and fl flew those rickety old planes, right? You think of my grandfather, who not only embodied the, the fighter pilot of the First World War, but also had the personality to go with it. He was, you know, handsome and movie star, interesting, and, and uh, embodied there everything. He is right exactly. There. Exactly. Yes. Not a bad looking yes, guy. Yes, no, and I yeah. thought so. Um, so, you know, he, um, but, but, but his claim to fame, of course, was that he shot down 72 German planes. And in World War I, that was the, the, the way that they, they, they looked at he heroes. There mm. was a measurement stick, mm. and there was only one other pilot um, that exceeded that score. Well, there was a French pilot who exceeded the score, but he was the largest scoring, highest scoring Commonwealth pilot. And you get asked all the time if he ever faced off against the Red Baron, right? Right. And he never did. He never did. Mm. I mean, in his book, he said he, he had seen him somewhere, mm. but uh, no, he never actually did. Now, people obviously uh, would know your grandpa's name because the island airport in Toronto is named mm -hmm. after him. The airport in his native Owen Sound <laughs> is named <laughs> after him. He's got two airports named after him. Yeah. And of course, he's got a chest full of medals. Where are those medals now? Well, that, that's the story that I start the book with, of course, is that for the longest time when I was growing up, I didn't, you know, I wasn't really that interested in my grandfather's war exploits as a little girl until it became useful to me. <laughs> and it became useful to me when my grade five teacher said uh, that we needed to do a history project on Canadian history. And so I figured what a be best way to get an A in, in, in my school is uh, to do a, a project on my grandfather. But I needed a prop. So that prop was my grandfather's breastplate of medals, which honestly are about this size, and had 15 medals, including the Victoria Cross, which is the most coveted of all. And my father kept them in his den, in his underwear drawer. And I say right in the book, I mean, if you saw the sorry state of my father's underwear, <laughs> this was really saying something. So my father would take them out to show us periodically, and we were told never to go and touch them. I have a younger brother. And of course, that meant that any chance we got we would go and look at them with our friends. And you took them to school one day. Well, this was the thing. So one day I waited and I thought, if I'm gonna do that history project, I'm gonna take these medals. So I snuck them out in a brown paper bag and I literally took them to school, which was about two blocks away. And I pulled them out in front of my classmates. And my teacher, who I had a huge crush on, <laughs> he just, his jaw dropped to the floor. And of course I had every young boy in the classroom just asking me, you know, to, to spend some time with me. I'm, I'm literally like eight or seven you or eight. You were a star from I was day. a star from that yeah. day. But that was really the day that he, um, my relationship started with him. Mm. And I began to realize that my identity was going to be wrapped up in this man. Because, you know, honestly, he died when I was three years old. So yes. I didn't know him. You have virtually no firsthand memory no, of him at all. No, not at all. He married well. Who did he marry? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I don't tell too many people about that, but my grandmother, who is, uh, you know, literally one of my, my heroes, too, um, she was Timothy Eaton's grand, uh, granddaughter. So she grew up in privileged and private schools and summers in Muskoka and all those lovely things. And she met Billy when she was, you know, um, a, a young woman, but before he was a hero. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know whether he wanted to go out with her or not. Um, so they, he, pay, he actually, somebody had to pay him a couple of bucks to say, would you spy her from the living room window when she comes for tea? So she was invited to tea and he liked what he saw. So they courted and then of course um, he went off to war, came back a hero and they married in between his uh, missions there. Now coincidentally enough, your father was also a fighter pilot. 
in World War II and has a very cute line about the father-son combination. Yeah, and he used it every chance he got. He would say to people, you know, between my father and I, we shot down 73 German planes. <laughs> my father shot down 72 and I shot down one. So, but the, you know, the book um, became, it started, the, the, the memoir started as a series of short stories about my childhood. <laughs> and then I started showing them to people and they said, you know, there's more to explore here. And so my father became a big, big part of the story because my relationship with my father was tied up with his relationship with his father. And it gets very heavy, which we'll get to in a second mm -hmm. after I confirm one last thing. Grandpa's a pilot, dad's a pilot. Yep. You ever flown a plane? Never, and I'm a little bit nervous about flying, I'm, I'm ashamed to say. That is really weird. <laughs> <laughs> but you did work for an airline once. I did, and I, well, I think I, I got scared. I, I was four years in China, as you probably know, as yep. Beijing bureau chief for CTV News, which was a wonderful time in my life. And I took a lot of sort of planes that I'm glad I, that period of my life is over. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Well, here we go. Here's a quote from the book. There is no doubt in my mind that Billy Bishop has been one of the greatest influences in my life, propelling me to be adventurous and courageous, but also haunting me to try too hard, be too hard on myself, and feel like I could never measure up. That impact is what I needed and wanted to understand better. This is, um, this is tough stuff because um, you talk about Billy Bishop's syndrome. <laughs> okay, what is that? Yeah, well, on the lighter side, Billy Bishop syndrome is something my brother and I coined when we were very young, and we thought it was the, the most dreaded of all diseases, and that is that you had this famous relative that you had to live up to, and you had to be great, and you couldn't just be ordinary at anything. You had to try harder, and if you didn't succeed, you'd have to try again and try again and try again. And we figured that, of course, my father, being the closest, of, like any celebrity, the son of any celebrity or daughter of any big celebrity, I'm sure Prince Charles or somebody else has, you know, ha has a those feelings too, they go through that, you know, who are you, you know? And my grandfather was a, the, had a leading role in his own movie. Well, I look at my father and say, he had the, the supporting role in his father's movie. Mm. And so I think it, it gets watered down with each generation, but I think both my brother and I were very much impacted by, you know, who were we? How did we fit into the family narrative? And how good did we have to be in order to be enough? I struggled with that most of my life. I just kept pushing and driving myself and trying to do better and, and be a perfectionist. I was the perfect daughter. I had to have the big career. Well, All the of point those of things. exhaustion at some point, I right? Did. You got chronic got fatigue very, syndrome at yes, one point. Yes, they never really diagnosed it, but because the name hadn't been really come up with yet. Um, but I've talked to a lot of people since, and, and the doctor that um, finally said, I think we're dealing with something like that. Um, I was two and a half years, pretty much, without being able to do anything in my mid-20s. Out of commission? Out of commission. I could barely walk up stairs. <laughs> and um, I, you know that was sort of a very private time in my life that I kept to myself. Well, your father's equivalent, I guess, if I can put it this way, uh, was the bottle. Your yeah. father had a very bad relationship with alcohol. How did that affect everything? It was him that made me realize, well, I write a lot about the fact that the, we have labels for everything now. And the word alcoholic, nobody used that word back in the 50s and 60s, that Mad Men era, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was you drank too much, you were tight, you were loaded, you know, you got sloshed, all of these terms that we all grew up with. But the word alcoholic was taboo in my family. And I've heard since that a lot of people had that same issue. So my father, um, I think it was the nature of the fighter pilot in a way, and maybe a lot of people that came through those two world wars, is that's how they numbed the pain. As you know, they didn't talk about their experiences afterward except the fun they had, the fun they had in the world wars, which always blew me away. And they didn't talk about the killing no. and the mayhem no, they must have seen as well. No, it was all the girls they went out with yeah. and the parties they had and how much they drank, which was a badge of honor. So they then developed that habit and came back and brought it home with them. And so that was, in my family, that was the family secret. I mean, people knew, but we never talked about it. And, um, and the repercussions were that we had to deal with that man who was in some sort of pain, and that's how he, he had, you know, rages as well. So the alcohol numbed his experiences, I think, and also his, his, the fact that he, he, he just had this deep-seated anger. Well, you don't spare us the details, and let's do another <laughs> excerpt from the book here, because your, your father's profanity was really quite pronounced mm. with your mother. Yeah. And here we go. Language like that paralyzed me. I heard it so often, so often it made me numb and then furious. 
My own anger would rise up and almost overwhelm me. I wanted to lash out, scream at him, beat my fists against his chest and tell him to stop. In those moments, I wanted to tell my father to go away and never come back. But something always stopped me. I was afraid of him, afraid that I would make things worse. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I need to understand more about that because mm -hmm. clearly your father was, you were all t terrified of him when he got into, the, into that state. Yeah. What, what sort of stopped you other than a fear of making things worse from confronting him on it and saying, you have a problem with alcohol and you're awful as a result and we have to do something about this? That's such a good question. I think, um, and I don't really have a good answer for you except that my mother was so ashamed and she didn't want anybody to know. And so we took it, we just took it and we found a way to live around it. But it was a sad life, especially for my mother. At least I knew that I could leave and my, my brother would end up going off and having you know, his own life too, but she was stuck with it. So, and you know what, it wasn't just us. I mean, we had other parts of the family that were dealing with that kind of thing as well, but nobody was talking to each other about it. But your grandpa wasn't like that, was he? Well, this is the thing, is that I think in some ways they all had a drinking problem because I think it was the culture of the, of the fighter pilot and possibly even, as I say, the war years. But he wasn't an angry, I mean, from what you've said not in the book, he was not an angry, angry vicious person. drunk. Absolutely the yeah. opposite. This yeah. was a gentleman. The most that my grandfather ever did was if he got angry, he would apparently go, well, well, and that was it. He was just full huh. of fun. So no, he didn't have that deep seated, but he did have a lot of, you know, he probably had post-traumatic stress disorder. He kept that bottle of, that bottle of scotch mm. and a little bit of a glass of scotch beside his bed at night. And spent the odd night in jail? <laughs> Well, that was a big thing for me, too, as a journalist, you know. Um, I tell that story in Montreal where I ran into the chief of police, and he actually connected my name with my grandfather, which was very unusual in Montreal. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then thinking that he was going to say how wonderful he was, and he did. It was very affectionate, but he said, you know, yes, we saw your grandfather quite often, and he was, whenever he got a little bit too much to drink, we'd have to put him in a cell for a night. <laughs> well, you can imagine my reaction to that. I was completely... Yeah. Flabbergasted. Yeah. yeah. Back to your, your, your parents' marriage again. Uh, did you and your mom ever have a conversation which went something like, this is intolerable and either you got to leave or we got to throw them out or something's got to change? Absolutely. Um, and I think I mentioned it briefly that, that, you know, I said, why can't we go and live with your parents, for instance? Why can't we go somewhere? And I think, A, the shame again, but also we didn't have any money. Hmm. You know, my, my father talks a lot about foof and foom. And These are being, acronyms, yes. Yes, acronym for fine old Ontario families, and FOOM was fine old Ontario money. And we ha were a fine old Ontario family, according to him, with no FOOM, <laughs> fine old Ontario money. So you're money. a FOOF, but no FOOM. No foof, exactly. <laughs> so um, we didn't have any money, so we didn't have anywhere hmm. to go. And she wasn't very close to her own parents, so there was nowhere for us to turn. Hmm. Yeah. You were once asked if your father could choose between you and a bottle of scotch, mm. which would he choose? And you said, without hesitation, the scotch. And then as soon as the words were out of your mouth, what? I was, that was the, a turning point in my life. I mean, I'd been led with some therapy to that particular revelation. And that's when I really realized that people with alcohol have a disease mm. and that it's not really personal, but it felt so personal that, that he would choose the ball over me. Whether that was actually true, you though, Steve, it. or not, I felt that way. Yeah. And, uh, but that to me, to me was the beginning of the healing process for me to realize that this man probably was somebody I didn't know, had been through things that I didn't understand, and that maybe it was time for me to look at that. Uh, can I get really personal here of for a course. second? I mean, you kind of do in the book. So, uh, did you ever marry? No. And no children. Shall we play amateur psychologist here and infer why that was? No, and I, you know, I want to talk about that because. Um, that was probably one of the hardest things for me to talk about in the book. It happened at the end, pretty much, that I went back and looked at that. And I wouldn't have been able to write that if I hadn't written what I've written up to that point. Because what I realized was part of this book was written for the women in my family. And I was lucky. I was brought up in a generation where I had some choices, that I could make choices like that and be okay with them. It wasn't easy. It was a struggle, but, but they were there. Um, whereas I looked at my gra two grandmothers, both of whom were very accomplished women and had to pretty much take a back seat to the, the men in their family. Um, my mother definitely struggled with 
you know, really having most of her life and her dreams. I didn't even know what my mother's dreams were. She did what she was expected of her. And when I looked at all of that, and I had aunts as well in that position from that, those generations, and something inside of me said, that will never happen to me. And um, it was almost to the point where I didn't trust myself to marry without getting trapped. And so... So you didn't? I didn't. So I put my energies into other things. I struggled with it. I think now I can look at it and say, you know what, that really was the right decision for me all along. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually quite happy I did it that way. Yeah. There will be another generation of Canadians for whom the name Billy Bishop is related to a National Film Board documentary that they saw called The Kid Who Couldn't Miss, mm -hmm. in which, well, which basically trashes your grandfather's record. Mm -hmm. What was the gist of that film? It's so interesting because the, um, we knew the director. We had cooperated with the film board on it. I think they, the, the, the director went in with good intentions to make a film about Billy Bishop. But he found, um, and it really goes back to the Imperial War Museum, he found a tape from a First World War pilot from there who had made some allegations. This person no longer was alive, but there was a tape, um, who suggested that maybe Billy Bishop was a little bit too ambitious and maybe had been fraudulent in some of the... The, um, the claims that he made of the 72 planes um, and that, you know, maybe he was making them up in order to get a higher score, that kind of thing. The interesting thing that was that was a very small part of the film and it was actually uh, an interview that he did with another pilot who said, did you ever hear of Billy Bishop's reputation like that? And this pilot came back very affirmly, affirmatively and said, that was not in the nature of the man that I knew. So there was nothing in that film except that little piece of information. But it, it, it but got that, all the headlines. And we know how that works, yeah. right? Is that yeah. if the media gets wind of something, they, they went and they explored it further. Mm -hmm. And there was never really any evidence or anything to this effect. But it started a national controversy that ended up in the Senate uh, in 1985, during the 80s, mm -hmm. um, where they aired... Uh, they put the director in front of uh, the senators, and the senators asked a lot of questions. So it became a big public debate. I found that very interesting, but, and I had to deal with this in the film a little bit. It was, again, very difficult for me to, to, go, to tackle this because I knew as a granddaughter that I couldn't really defend my grandfather, who was going to believe me. I couldn't find the, the, the bullet, you know, the magic bullet to do it. So what was I going to do? What I realized, though, was that when he had fallen off his pedestal in terms of the public, something happened to my identity at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that is like, had I fallen too, because my identity was so wrapped up in, in this person. I, I felt like I had modeled myself after this wonderful person. Well, if he was a liar, what did that say about who I was? It was really an identity crisis for me. I took it extremely personally. Well, on the other hand, you were in a profession which allowed you to fight back in the way in which a reporter slash journalist slash documentary filmmaker can fight back, and you made your own. <laughs> I did. A Hero to Me I did. was your documentary. Yes, I made that in 2002, which was really just the beginning of writing this book. I mean, I, I, that was my first attempt to, to explore that. And you did some more exploration, and did, yeah. you, ever, did you ever satisfactorily, you know, to, conclusively determine what the truth was? No, but I had to find my own truth. And it came from something very simple, is that first I looked at what kind of a pilot he was and how he'd survived. The one thing I learned about my grandfather that I didn't know before I wrote this book, because I did learn some things about him that I didn't know, and that was that he went out even on his day off to fight the enemy. Hmm. So can you imagine? I mean, he would go on, he'd go on a mission. He liked to go out by himself in the early morning. That's how he got his reputation. But then he'd go out again with, with, his, with his squadron. And then on his day off, when everybody else was, you know, going into town or whatever, he went out again. So obviously a little bit obsessed. Mm. Um, but, but that was an interesting thing for me to learn about him because I thought, you know, what a reckless strategy. That's not a strategy of somebody who's trying to, you know, be fraudulent in any way because the, the chances of him uh, surviving that. I mean, the average lifespan of a First World War pilot was 10 days. Yeah, and he the survived were terrible every, to begin with. absolutely yeah. terrible, you know. So there, there was that whole aspect of it. But the thing that really turned, my, turned me was my aunt, my father's sister, who said, I just can't imagine Billy Bishop, her, her father, with such a magnificent lie. Hmm. And I laughed because none of our, nobody in our family can keep a secret for more than two minutes, <laughs> you know. So I just couldn't imagine that. And, and actually it was that 
that turned me around. It's a bit like the Kennedy conspiracy in a way. You know, you'd figure if it was a real conspiracy, I mean, who can keep that kind of a secret for, what is it now, going on 50 some Absolutely. odd years? Absolutely. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> well, here's, uh, you know, by the time I got to the end of the book, I started to ask, uh, you know, he had the greatest moments of his life. By the time he turned 23, mm -hmm. what do you do for an encore? What do you do for the rest of your life mm -hmm. if, the, if you know your greatest moments ever are at the age of 23. Do you know, did, did he have an answer for that question? No, I don't think he did, but I think, I'm, I'm sure he thought about it because I thought a lot about it mm -hmm. when I was writing the book. The thing about my grandfather that I hope I actually have inherited a little bit of is that he decided to make the most of his life no matter what. So he wasn't afraid to try things that didn't work. He, he became kind of a failed business person with all his ventures. He started an air, airline with uh, Billy Barker, which was another VC, um, and that was terrible. It didn't work out. Um, and, but then he, he, aviation was the love of his life. Mm -hmm. And so he was instrumental in starting the Canadian Air Force, the Royal Canadian Air because there wasn't one mm -hmm. during the First World War. And then he got very much involved with Winston Churchill in the lead up to the Second World War, helping to recruit pilots and really creating the British uh, Commonwealth Training Program. But what I've learned since the book too is I'm getting a lot of people emailing me and calling me and saying they have letters from Billy Bishop, hmm. for, from a letter that Billy would write to their, their father or grandfather. And it would just be a nice note to say, we're so glad that you're, you're, you've joined the, 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 the Air Force and, and things like that. He had an incredible capacity for making people feel special. And yet he died so young. Yeah, he used up everything. My father said that his hair turned gray by the time he was 30, hmm. and he looked 40. Hmm. But again, I admire that about him because he just, he went spent. He, he did everything. He never, you know, missed a moment. I'll never forget the day he died because it was on, it was 9-11. He died on September 11th, 1956. That's right. I know, isn't that strange? Yeah. Yeah. You, let's come back now to daughter and father. Mm -hmm. You eventually reconciled with your dad. How important was that for you to have done? Yeah, I won't give that away, how I did that. Um, um, that was everything because I realized as he, my father started to slip into dementia after my mother died and my mother's death was really tragic for me. And so I was left with this man of who I became his emotional and support and entertainment for the most yeah. part. And you know, I loved my father for so much but I had this push and pull relationship with him and, um, and I was angry with him and all sorts of things that needed to be resolved. And as he started to, you know, none too gracefully because as he, he got dementia, he didn't calm down, he got crazier. And, um, and, and in some cases, it was quite funny, some of the things that happened, mm -hmm. but also quite sad. I just realized that he was going to die angry, but I was not going to. And so it was really important for me to find a way to, to forgive him. And I did. I presume you could not have written this book if either one of your parents were still alive. Absolutely not because I was still in it. I was still in the process of doing it. I could say that's the cowardly way out is wait till they've all gone to write the book. Mm -hmm. But I still have my family. I still have five, all, there are five of us all together who are Billy Bishop's grandchildren. And I sent them the manuscript in advance and said, this is what I'm gonna do and I'd love your input if you want and, and, and let them, you know, let them, I said, I'm gonna do it anyway, but I want you to know that this, I'm doing this for me and I feel very strongly about it. Anybody and, try and talk you out of it? No. Um, you know, I think there were a few people, they were uncomfortable. They, mm -hmm. they warned me about writing a memoir. Everybody in your family, somebody in your family is going to be uncomfortable with it. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it's turned into bringing us all a lot closer. Mm -hmm. And that's the greatest gift I could have gotten. Just finally, where's Billy Bishop buried? Up in Owen Sound, near where mm -hmm. he was um, born. There's still the homestead there is still the museum. And my father's buried beside him. So it's, it's, it's lovely. We, I go and visit at least once a year to nice. save him. Yeah. I can't tell, well, I can tell you how much I love the book. Oh, I'm so it's glad. It's just a great, great read, and you don't spare us much, I have to say. <laughs> it's very blunt, but um, reflective of, I'm sure, the way a lot of families are dealing with a lot of problems, and therefore, it's worth getting it out there. Thank you so much. Diana Bishop, living up to a legend, which is what she's had to do. My adventures with Billy Bishop's ghost. So good to see you again. Thank you. You as well. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.